I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Debbie here with composer Christopher Lennitz. Christopher, you delivered another compelling, loud, layered, propulsive score for the boys. And that's what we expect. And then the first track on the album is this soaring, beautiful power ballad that you wrote. Who would have thought that would come out of the great mind of Chris Lennart? So can you talk us through Never Truly Vanish, which is performed by Erin Moriarty. Talk us all about how it, it came about. Uh, it was, I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing. Uh, that first email I remember I got from Eric, from C Eric Krippy, who, who uh, created the show and, and, and we were old, old friends. And, and he said, all right, what I need you to do is write me like a Celine Dion Oscar winning power ballad, like Titanic, but instead it's about a dead, invisible dirtbag superhero. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, let's do this. He's like, and Starlight's going to sing it. And I'm like, can she sing? And he said, apparently she, she, her, her rep said she sings. Um, and I said, great, let's do this. So I, I, the first thing I did was get on the phone with, with uh, Aaron and just like got an idea for her range and, and, and her you know, sort of what she had sung before. And, and, and I, I quickly realized that she's, I mean, obviously she's got a great speaking voice, but I'm like, okay, um, I, th I think she can sing. We didn't, we didn't actually have her in the same studio yet. But I said, I, I got an idea for, for the range and now I know how to, you know, what range to write it in. So then I just went and I, and I had a script and it said, you know, it said all the hilarious things that, that I'm watching and they're going to do, you know, they're going to do a big funeral service and they're going to literally have an invisible yarmulke and it's, it's floating around and, you know, and I'm watching this thing, you know, and I know the boys by now and I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing, right? And so I said, this needs to be so over the top it needs to be like every bit as big and schmaltzy as, you know, something that like Celine or, or Whitney would do. And then it's got to be the lyrics have to be so on point in terms of, you know, being powerful. But then when you really look into them, there are all these little puns. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like that was a big part of it. And, and the title came from the from um, uh, Matt Schwartzman, who who did the. Uh, the 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 um the script for the first step for that episode and uh and he wrote the 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 main uh the main hook uh, of the lyrics and I, I just thought never truly banish no truly really vanish vanish <laughs> that'd be a different one but i heard uh i i just thought never truly vanish is such a perfect thing to sing um and then and then to to make it never through, truly vanish through from our hearts is, is perfect to sing with so, so much emotion. So then I kind of got down and, and sat down and started writing the thing. And I knew it had to be sort of slow and I knew it had to have these verses that were very intimate, but then it was supposed to like explode in the chorus. And that was really what, what Eric's, um, Eric's direction was, was when that happens, he's going to have the whole, you know, the whole auditorium filled with all the people at the funeral and everybody's going to be crying and they're going to be showing, you know, shots of, of, of an invisible suit and, 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 uh, and, you know, they ended up doing an invisible, like a, a see-through casket with just a suit in it. I mean, it was so brilliant that, and, and warped. And so the boys, it was so much of, of, of what the, the boys is all about that, that I was just like, all right, I need to, I need to go for this 100%. So I, um, I ended up writing this thing, sent it to Eric and, you know, with very few alterations, he loved it. And then we sent it to Aaron. And Erin was just dying laughing. Like she was like, oh my God, this is hilarious. And I said, okay, so now we got to do this thing. So um, uh, we enlisted a producer friend of mine, uh, Alex Beringas, a uh, pop producer. And we got together with him at his studio uh, in the Valley. And, you know, Erin showed up and crushed it. Like we yeah. were both sitting there going, oh my God. I remember I sent a video to Eric, to, to Kripke, like from the session. I'm like, oh my God, you're not going to believe this. And, and he just immediately texted me back was like she's amazing this is gonna be so great so everyone just got like pumped from the very get-go and then i think once they they decided they were going to go for it that's when they 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 made this the funeral so big and phil sagrisha who directed the episode is an old friend and and did, did such an amazing job of like the grandeur and tying in sort of the vaught over the topness um because you know everything that vaught does as a corporation in the boys is this idea of, you know, publicity stunt, shiny. It's all like about, you know, what's your ratings? How many hits do you have? How many likes do you get? Like, it's all built in that world of, uh, you know, of social 
immediate gratification. So they built this funeral sequence and this song to be that, you know, which turned out great. And then, and then the icing on the cake was then they kept playing the song throughout the remainder of the whole season. And so it kept coming on the song, you know, it would come on the radio when she's in the car with Huey having a fight. And then it would come on in a, in a coffee shop. And, and, uh, and I just thought it was such a great little gag to keep going through the whole season, but but yeah, it was it was amazing for, for me to be able to you know stretch. Obviously, it's very different from the rest of the music and the boys. Um, and I'm super you know grateful that Eric trusted me to to kind of swing for a completely different fence. So uh, so I swung I, I swung and I swung hard. Um, so yeah. I'm hoping I'm hoping everybody liked it. But I think it came out really great. And I think it's it it very much while it's very musically different than the boys, it's exactly the kind of yeah. humor that we like to do. Yeah, and. Um... Like, this is the thing that is so clever about the song. So it's like, as you say, Vought, anything Vought related is carefully and meticulously curated and it has to be, um, it has to put out a certain vibe. So, you, and, and, the, and, the, and Starlight and Homelander on the stage, they're all very sincerely doing their thing, playing their part for the corporation and saying goodbye to their best buddy, Translucent, right? So that's all quite sincere, but the song itself is so tongue-in-cheek and kind of ridiculous. And then it's actually a really beautiful song and it's and it goes with those high notes and it's got some beautiful melodies in there. So you're playing with so many tones. And as you listen to it, you, you notice that, but you notice it more when you see it on the screen. And that's why, as you say, they did such a great job by really show, um, showcasing it. So you must be super proud of the way that it, it finally came out. Yeah, absolutely. It fit in the show just sort of the way we had dreamed it up, which, you know, when that kind of thing happens, you know, especially for a humor moment in a show that's as biting and, and sort of like uh, irreverent as the boys, you kind of go, okay, we, we nailed it. We, we got that right. And, and it was really fun to be able to do that. Yeah. I always wonder with um, composers on second seasons and, and further seasons, you know, you've, you've really established so much of the groundwork of how the show is going to sound musically in season one. So talk us through some of the opportunities that you had to introduce new things or cues for some of the new characters on season two. Yeah. Well, there was some, I mean, the nice thing about, the show is that you know I, I loved season one and I actually think season two was even better yeah. and and you know and you know a hallmark of a great show is when they add characters and the characters are, the new characters are every bit as good as the original characters um and you know so when you add Giancarlo Esposito and you add uh, Aya Cash as, as Stormfront and have that be your your new additions they're so strong and there's Obviously, you know, for those who have watched, you know, the, the, the second season, there's there's so much new depth to the characters, especially, you know, Stormfront's backstory um, and how that relates to Vaught. There was a lot to play with. Um, and, and the thing that I think is interesting, we found out after we got done sort of doing our first pass on, on episode one of season two, one of the things that Eric kind of said to me was, you know, I'm, I'm figuring out that season two actually needs to be a little bit more internal musically. And it needs to, it's, it, there's not as many of those big like orchestral moments like there were in the first season where it was more about superheroes and things where, you know, we kind of know that that's not really the truth here. So, you know, while we do do that when we're doing bot propaganda, the, the real intensity of, of season two comes from, from, you know, from Butcher getting, Butcher and his wife, you know, meeting again and, and, and all those moments, um, they're the moment on the bridge uh, with them when, when they finally are able to talk in private, you know, that was very, very minimal and, and super intense. Um, same kind of thing with, uh, you know, Homelander, <laughs> you know, there's some, there's some really intense moment, you know, when he pushed the kid off the, pushed his son right off the roof and things where it's, it's funny at first, but then like, we used very, very, you know, intense, small strings to, to just hit home that point of like, this is actually a, a, a ch child issue of his um, that he was going through because of the way he was raised. Um, and then with Stormfront, you know, one of the things that Eric was really serious about was he didn't want to give away too much to the audience too early about where she was coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and that she had this, you know, horrific Nazi past. So it wasn't really until like, episode seven and eight 
that we were able to get into the real, you know, there was a, the, a motive that we used as she was, um, you know, as she was killing um, uh, Karen, the, the female's brother on the, on the roof. And I think it was step seven or eight. And, you know, and, and as she was running up the steps, we got to use this, this motive, which was her, her theme that does feel very military and, and sort of old school, but like, I, I tried to use it a couple, I tried to hint at it some er earlier in the season and, and Eric's like, nope, we don't know that yet. You know, we know that, but the audience doesn't know that. So we really tried to be very careful about uh, divulging that in information at the right time. But, but the fact that it was a more intense and probably more intimate score, but it was also, I think, a little bit more dissonant. Um, there was a lot of dissonance. There was a lot of uncomfortableness. And, and for me, who a lot of my, a lot of my career comes from, you know, I, I, with, with things like Lost in Space or, or some of the films that I've done, you know, it's very melodic. Even the song is very melodic. So, so I don't get asked very often. I don't get the chance and the freedom very often to do things that really make your stomach churn and really make, hopefully make the people who are watching the show as Homelander is, you know, is sipping that milk out of the fridge or, or imagining, you know, imagining that, that, you know, a uh, doppelganger, you know, uh, you know, berating him in, in a, uh, in, in his, uh, his, his suit, you know, it's like that to be able to do that and just sort of twist that, let that intensity meter to the point where it's like, it's ugly and it sounds nasty and it's not pleasant at all. And it's, and it's really disturbing. I mean, that's what that's Eric used that word disturbing so many times when we were going over things in season two, because he really wanted it to be like almost to the point of, of, of painful uncomfortableness. Um, and I, I hope that's where we got and I, and I don't get a chance to do it often. So it, yeah. for me, it was really exciting to be able to do that. I'm so glad that you said that because for, for me as the listener, I picked up on so many of those things and I, you never completely know whether this is the intent of the composer. And that's exactly what you just said. Like, for example, my favorite track on season two album is fake news. And that's where that's the one that starts with a gorgeous guitar theme. The whole song sounds so perilous and unpredictable. And then it builds into this more urgent and ultimately very immersive sound that is more ambient. And I just found it very difficult to point, put my finger on exactly what was going on in that track because it's so complex. Can you briefly talk us through that one? Um, well, I mean, I think the, the, you know, I think that's something we try to do a lot on The Boys is, you know, and I think that's something that Eric does often with his characters is he grounds them in something that's very, uh, you know, very emotional, you know, and, and those guitars at the beginning is it, supposed to start you in that place that gives us somewhere to go. And then, you know, and then we really, you know, use on the boys, we do a lot of our own, you know, sound creation and, and the sounds, you know, if I'm remembering that track correctly, you know, there is lots of guitar noise of just amps buzzing and, um, and, and, and just mm -hmm. scraping things like dulcimers, and um, we, have, we have a Turkish dulcimer that's got a really low bottom end that kind of gives you that low rumble. And then, and then the other thing we do so much of is really slow pitch bending. Um, and we do a lot of that kind of thing uh, in there as well, where, we, where you don't even really notice it, but it's like a floating pitch that gets a little flat and gets a little, yes. a little sharp. And, 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 and as that happens, you just, you, your hair kind of stands up on the back of your head and your back of your neck. And, and, and that's, that's a lot of, of what's going on there. You, when you say things like, like ambient, you know, one of the, the issues with some music that's ambient is that it doesn't go anywhere. And, and then if it goes somewhere too jarring or too fast, it's no longer ambient. So one of the things that, that Eric really likes is when you think you're starting with this nice guitar and then you have these kind of floating ambient sounds and you've got this, you've got rumbles and things coming in, but then they just start to just go a little sour. And he uses the word curdle a lot. And, and we use the word curdle. We got this starting in, in season one. And, we, and whenever we slowly change the pitch of an instrument or the whole orchestra, sometimes, you know, he'll say, oh, no, no, here's where it should curdle. And what he means by that is something's going on internally with the character that requires us to sort of feel like 
we're in their head and shit is starting to spiral out of control and, and it's getting, getting really disturbing. And, and so what we'll do is we'll do that by whether it be bending the notes on a bass or, or, you know, moving the finger on a, on a, on a solo cello or literally taking the computer and having the computer take the entire cue and have it slowly bend down over a period of time. It's almost like, you know, it's, it's almost like that feeling like when you're in, in, in an elevator and it, you know, gets to the bottom floor and then it kind of keeps going for that last couple of inches and, and it's slow. And you're like, I don't know, are we stopped yet? Where are we going with this? And it's sort of that weird feeling of it, it keeps you on your guard. And it, and it, it, like you said, it makes you not really know what to expect yet or next, well, not yet, but yet next. And I think what you really keyed, on, keyed in on is, is more than just musically, that's what, that's what the boys is all about. Like it's, it's taking 25, 30 years of superhero tropes and stereotypes and genre, uh, you know, sensibilities. And it's always looking to say, well, here's where you think you're going to go next. No, we're going to go with this way. And we're going to have, you know, Homelander literally, you know, blow someone up with a, explosive in their butt i mean it's like there's so many ridiculous things that happen but i think what you're getting at and what you really latched onto is so it, it's such a great example of what the boys is as a whole in terms of and, and what i try to do musically is when we think here's where it's going to go next we'll try to go somewhere else and we'll try to go there in a way that sort of slides you into it rather than uh ra so so you're kind of it's almost like when you walk through the door of a, of a haunted house and you're already in there and you're like, yeah. oh, shit. If you would have heard the scary noises before you walked in, you probably would have turned around and not gone into the house. But a lot of what we do, I think, on the boys and with the music is we're going to sort of lull you in with those things like nice guitars or, 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 a, or a string thing or something and, and get you to the point where you're like, oh, I think this is going OK. This is going to be fine between you know, between Homelander and Stormfront and you're like, no, it's not going to be fine at all. It's going to be horrible. And then you kind of figure it out and, and it takes you to that place, but it's too late because you're already there and you're already invested in the characters and the story. And, and hopefully that's what, uh, what, what, what the music's doing. Hopefully I think that's what, what that particular track does really, really well. Yeah, that's precisely what I was getting at. And um, it's not like it's a jarring, unexpected change. It's a, a lull, a false sense of security almost. And your music is so critical to that. Another example is this track called Pitch, which is really cool superhero vibes. It's got a lot of that propaganda video sound um, and the Marvel DC kind of like aesthetic. And then you just pull the rug from under us and it ends on a flat, curdled, no, I love that word. That's perfect. Exactly. That's a good one. Um, the other thing I was going to mention briefly, because we're almost running out of time, is how um, varied the score is. So you've got a, a track like Halloween Store, which is these plucky strings with a muscular bass. And then you've got um, towards the end of the album, um, Homelander in Hallway, which is just this rapid classical um, violin melody. Like you've really just thrown so much at us in this score. It's not just raspy metal this time. There's a lot no. going on here, isn't there? There is. And I think there's more. Uh, I think, you know, that's one of the things that that, you know, that you, you brought up at the beginning was this idea of like going from season one to season two um, of any show or, or into further seasons. You know, there's there is. Yes, there's things that you've developed in season one that that stay and the need to stay because it's the vernacular of the show. But at the same time, when it's a great show and it's adding great characters and the plot is getting so much more deep and you're learning so much more about all of these characters and the way they relate to each other and you're you're learning about Kamiko and Frenchie and you're learning about uh now Huey and Starlight are having a much more deep relationship as that depth comes in that allows you allows me to have a much more varied range because you've got real real love between those two you know, groups of, you've got real love between Frenchie and Kamiko. And you've got this, this amazing, you know, you know, emotion between Huey and Starlight. But then you've got, now you've got a, a Nazi and you've got um, Homelander who's having these ridiculous childhood issues. And he, but he's trying to be a dad. And he's actually trying to be a, what he thinks might be a good dad, but it's 
it's a mess. And so like, there's all these extra layers. So all of the layers of season one are still there. And then there's like all these additional amazing layers and nuances and backstories that have come out with season two. So for me, what it allows is I think hopefully it's actually a, a much more varied album, you know, besides just obviously the songs, but, but the, the score itself has, there are much smaller moments. There's a couple of much bigger and more, more nasty, violent moments. Um, so I think the, the overall range of it is much wider. And I think, I, I think the, the score hopefully also much like the show is just a deeper and more varied and more, you know, full uh, experience than, than the first season was because I think there's just more to play with and there was more to get inspired by. Yeah. Well, congrats on a really strong season two, mate. And good luck um, for season three. We're really looking forward to that when it's finally done. Oh, we're working on it now. It's going to be really great. I think you're going to like it.